first of all, let's talk about why you should kind of listen to me. Let's start with the fact that I've been doing this since I had hair, as you can see from this picture. I did indeed start with surfing and then one hour lab back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And uh, 1984, we had to earn a living. And so we started Watts Color Lab, which was Princeton enlargements from slides and transparencies. And you can tell this is an oldie but a goodie. This is a a, an analog enlarger with lenses and a, that little white bottle is a bottle of film cleaner. That's that celluloid stuff that we used to use back in the day. And here's a paper processor for type R. Got to meet a lot of nifty people in the way of photographers, both professional and amateur from uh, not only local, but from around the world. Since 2001, I basically have been, well, as you can see, changed the name to Watch Digital Imaging because the whole industry changed. The analog product went away and the digital product came along. And so the whole industry was in turmoil for a while, but we did survive. I do, as you can see, a lot of uh, public speaking, although not so public now, mostly it's just over the airwaves. I've done a lot of judging or photo contests, including the San Diego County Fair photo contests, which I've done since probably 2002, uh, as well as the Orange County photo contest. Yes, I'm a grandpa and I, yes, I really need to change this picture. This kid's now eight years old. And first of all, for those that I don't know me, let me start with this. My name is John Watts with Watts Digital Imaging in San Diego, California, and I'm a post-processing specialist for photographers. Just so you know what it is I do. Uh, my motto is you take the perfect shot and I'll help you get the absolute most out of it, your printer or mine. Uh, and I can help you in three distinct ways, Photoshop instruction and services, light jet digital printing and finishing and color management products and services i do want to thank you before we go any further for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend and i always encourage questions there's a chat bubble in the go to meeting interface please if you have any questions as we go along type away and we'll get to them i am going to be working uh, when i get to photoshop i'm going to be working in photoshop creative cloud for those that do not have creative cloud uh, you need to email me because we need to get you on that. It's only $10 a month and it's the latest and greatest of the software. I noticed some folks that had uh, uh, sent in some questions that they were using older versions, CS6, CS5, and CS4. And you're really cheating yourself if you're not using the latest and the greatest. And it's really not as expensive as you might think. It's only $10 a month. I also will be working on a Mac rather than a PC. Don't let that scare you if there's any differences between the Mac and the PC function, I'll let you know. 99.999% of the time, it will be the way speed keys are handled. There is a 2080 rule when we're dealing with a subject as complex as this. Hopefully, you'll remember 20% of this tonight after we go through it. And the other 80%, you may forget, or as Priscilla, one of our attendees, likes to say, the other 80% is the homework. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because it's something I like to stress. Just watching these and not doing anything about it is going to be counterproductive, particularly when we're dealing with the subject matter we're dealing with today. These are five different classes. And of the five different classes, this is definitely the one that can be discouraging or boring, but I, I think as you go along, you're going to see that once I show you about the homework and what have you, it's going to make a big difference. So anyway, just a little bit more, more about me. These down here, uh, these that's a a photographic digital processor for paper right there, and these are light jet printers. We print with light, not with ink. It's not an inkjet printer. It's a sensitive metric product that actually has to be printed and processed in the dark. Okay, how best to learn uh, Photoshop through these meetups, and there are five of them total. This is number one. Uh, attend all five of these Photoshop 101 meetups, even if not sequentially, and you're going to be on the, on the fast track to getting the basics down. I do suggest strongly that you spend at least one hour per week at your computer with Photoshop. And uh, additionally, I would also suggest that you watch the videos that are linked in the notes. Remember, the very first page of these notes has a whole bunch of links, and there are other links throughout the notes that will be considered your homework. You're going to find, though, this one hour per week really goes very, very fast. You'll start getting into it, and before you know it, you've been at it two or three hours, and you're going, huh, this is kind of cool. Anytime you have a question, anytime at all, please contact me. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Email is usually best. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm also a, a drummer of over 50 years and I have the hearing that goes with it. So usually email is my preferred method of communication. 
some other things. By the way, all these things that I mentioned up here at the top, these are all free or require you to put some effort in without spending any money. There are some other things you can buy my Photoshop book on Amazon. There is a link at the very front. What we're going over tonight is actually most of section one of the book, just so you know. I also will be offering eventually small group workshop meetups, and they'll be very specific and, and limited in, in number of participants. The first ones will be on layer masks in particular. Again, also, if you need any kind of fine printing, whether it's uh, finished or not, I can do all sorts of finishing acrylic face mounts all the way down to just the prints with a little white around it, uh, whiteboard around it, and you can do your own mounting and matting. I also full, offer full-on color management products and services. If you have any questions about color management, uh, most people's <laughs> systems can be described as mismanagement. If you have any questions about color management, please let me know. I also have on the useful downloads page, you'll hear, you'll hear me refer to that a lot today or tonight. The useful downloads page is just that. There's all sorts of free stuff on there and you'll find right near the top, not only a 10 page PDF on the three successful steps to color management that you can download. There's also a series of short videos that will explain how to calibrate and profile your monitor and those links are in there also so let's see let me go to the next thing here ah yes i'm now starting and kind of going through page one and by the way if you have the book i'm on page a in the book temporarily you can think of this workshop as the roadmap, if you will, to, to Photoshop. Uh, I'll show you how to effectively navigate through a complex program, showing those functions you really need and want as a photographer. Uh, you'll learn what's important, what you can ignore. And without this roadmap, you'll truly be lost. So I would encourage you to uh, keep these notes around. You're going to re refer to them a lot. This roadmap is not sexy. This seminar is the automotive equivalent of the owner's manual, if you will. Uh, how to turn on your car, how to put your car in gear, all that kind of stuff, basic but necessary stuff. This is not glamorous. It's not exciting. So please do not get discouraged by tonight or bored, but do keep in mind and know that at the end of the day, you're only going to need to use about 10 to 15 percent of the program, which we'll discuss in detail in just a little bit. On these classes, on these five classes, the other classes are less PowerPoint and more actual hands-on Photoshop experience. You're gonna go on the five different meetups. You're gonna go from less exciting to more exciting as we go along. Those that have attended my class four know that because we kind of throw everything together too. And also this one has the most notes uh, of any of uh, the Photoshop 101 classes that I do. And keep these notes because you are gonna refer back to these notes the most uh, out of all of them. I can almost guarantee that. You can see a picture on here. The this is my idea of what most people think Photoshop is. That is a uh, from a Formula One racer, and it's just a nice little computer. After we're done here, uh, hopefully this is more of what Photoshop is going to look like to you uh, over the five meetups. Philosophy and method. I don't plan to teach you how to put children's heads on animals or make flashing and rotating text or how to create a surreal, mind-blowing digital masterpiece that defies logic and explanation. And there is a place for it, but that's not my gig. I teach Photoshop two and four photographers. So what I can teach you is how to make a great color print using the basics of Photoshop to achieve your desired results. And I think of Photoshop as my digital enlarger. In fact, if you re recall the picture back, let's see, where was it? Right here. That is a analog enlarger, just so you know. Right now we can use Photoshop and pretty much do what the enlarger will do as far as uh, image enhancement and manipulation. Why listen to me? Uh, same reason you listen to your doctor, training and experience. Like your doctor, I've learned what generally works and what doesn't. And also like your doctor, I am constantly learning new things and listening to new ideas. And as a, a doctor practices medicine after all, that's kind of scary when you get right down to it. But hey, that's what we're talking about. There's a lot of information available about Photoshop, but I'm not gonna teach you a complete Photoshop encyclopedia over the, uh, the course of five classes. Instead, I'll focus on getting you up and running with a minimum of hassle, learn to master the fundamentals of Photoshop and get great results. And once you master that material, I'll teach you, you can, you're able to expand your Photoshop horizons knowing you're starting with a good solid foundation. And that's basically what I was saying here and point number four on the screen. Let's go to page two in the notes. And if you have my book, we're on page three. 
So I like to think of my teaching method or philosophy as being analogous to a manual transmission versus an automatic transmission in a car. A manual transmission is mechanically simple, but will give you tons of control and higher performance over your automobile. I mean, they don't use automatic transmissions in NASCAR or Formula One for a reason, but it does come with a price, a learning curve, you know, hand-eye coordination and all that. And those that have learned to drive a stick don't even think about it. It becomes a, a kind of a, a instinctive is the word I'm looking for. And you don't even think about it anymore. The way I'm going to teach you may not seem instinctive, but once you start playing with it, you're going to find that just like a manual transmission, it's going to be simple, but lots of control and high performance. You should also notice that I said simple and not easy. There is a difference. Uh, nothing in life is, is easy by any, any stretch or, or nothing good in life is easy. Example, you can dig a hole in the dirt and it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. So you still have some work to do. And that's where the homework that I stress and I'll talk about that frequently as you go through comes in that you spend some time with these notes. There's no way in an hour and a half I can show you everything. All I can do is steer you in the right direction. And now you've got the notes and you can contact me for uh, uh, questions. I'm going to spend very little time on this next one and this would be part of your homework. Those that know me know I am not a big fan of Lightroom for a multitude of reasons. There are now three different posts on my blog. You'll hear, hear me refer to my blog also. You can think of the blog as educational and my main website as products and services if you will. So spend some time in the blog but there are three blog posts on photoshop versus lightroom wrong question part number one is listed in the links in the front you'll find a link to two in there as well as three so the part one is what we're going to read here in the notes on page i'm now on page two in the notes still i'm on page h and i if you are in my book main link you'll find a link to part two and it's really concerns more with do you really need lightroom and are you going to use Adobe Camera Raw or the develop module to achieve your goals? And the last part is if you are a dedicated Lightroom user, then it will explain the proper steps to migrate from Lightroom to Photoshop and back and safely back. So I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time with, with this Photoshop versus Lightroom wrong question. That is your your homework. And you actually have three posts that you want to read to do that. Normally, my workflow is I use Bridge, not Lightroom, to cull and decide which images that I want to actually make a master file because I do not bring every image into Photoshop. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Let's go to, to page four. And we're also on page four if you're in the book. And these next three pages are going to discuss some of the fundamental conventions, concepts, and controls used throughout Photoshop. And these are critical habits to get into. And like I said, you're going to refer back to these notes. So if you don't get all this the first time, don't worry about it. Just keep in mind that these fundamentals are discussed throughout this and future seminars. So don't get hung up on the details at this point. If something doesn't make sense right now, just move on. So the first bullet point on page four heed the advice of the old adage guy go garbage in garbage out and it's corollary good in and good out so you need to start with good dig uh, digitized images that are well exposed and composed otherwise and although photoshop is a very powerful program it is not a miracle program able to turn trash into diamonds remember the old csi show and you know they would take a screen grab of somebody 400 feet away from a tiny little itty bitty camera and they'll enlarge it and they can read the guy's social security number on his badge or whatever you know it's that's ridiculous uh so that's why i just wanted to say that no garbage in garbage out good in good out uh, let's see on the next uh, bullet point on the page here photoshop is just a tool a very powerful tool but a tool nonetheless and as i mentioned previously i think of it as my digital enlarger remember i showed you that picture of the enlarger earlier I think that makes sense. What I want you to do in a dark room and larger in the analog world, I can now do in Photoshop with lots more control and options. Uh, the next uh, bullet point is to keep it super simple. Start with the basics of Photoshop and grow into other functions as you need them. And as I mentioned earlier, most of the time, you're only going to need about 10 to 15% of Photoshop's functionality to achieve the results that you want. And you can pretty much ignore the rest. Sometimes less is more 
or as one of my clients recently put it, simplify and demystify. And I've applied that one to my life too. Simplify and demystify. Next bullet point down. Uh, when it comes to working with Photoshop, there are a zillion ways to get the job done. I could show you 20 ways to adjust your contrast. That being said, I found that the methods that I'm going to show you over the next five classes are the simplest, most effective, and least destructive to your file to achieve the desired results. And they are also time tested in a commercial and artistic environment, working environment. I mean, I've been doing this professionally since the, the 80s, and I've learned a few things along the way. <laughs> now, that being said, I'm, I am open to new suggestions. And, and new what have you, but a lot of times there's a re I probably already have tried to do what you're trying to do and found that there's a reason I don't. So if you got a question about that, let me know. And in fact, that goes to the next bullet point. I've also found that the generic tools such as brightness, contrast, or color balance controls are too global, simplistic, or destructive to the image to be of any major use. Remember, think the manual transmission versus the automatic transmission that I showed you earlier. And oh, by the way, I define destructive. Uh, as causing pixelization and posterization to your digital image resulting in bad prints, which is the bottom line. We want the best prints we can get. So would we go to class two in two weeks, we'll talk a lot about using levels and use saturation instead of the brightness and uh, brightness, contrast, and color balance tool. I've already mentioned this, practice, 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 homework, just like any other activity worth pursuing, you're gonna get more proficient and faster at Photoshop the more you practice. Uh, and it, it, again, that 2080 rule that we talked about earlier, the 80% that Priscilla described it so well when she said that that's the homework. So you'll remember 20% and the other 80% may be buried in here, but you're going to have to go and watch some videos, open uh, Photoshop and look at all these things that I'm showing you. Last bullet point on page four. There are two excellent sources of information often overlooked. The help section included with Photoshop, which is really good if you want to know how something is done, not necessarily why. Like if I ever wanted to know how to use the magnetic lasso tool, which I've literally never used, but if for some reason I decide I need to, I can find out how by you looking in the help section in Photoshop. And another overlooked resource is the internet, of course. Um, I've just dedicated a page to all of the videos that I've recorded this summer. On the links page at the front of the notes, at the very bottom, free Photoshop 101 videos. We're now getting into the second round of these. Let's go to page five and we'll talk about some concepts. Be safe with your original image files and duplicate your original. In case of major mistakes, file corruption, loss of data, and so on, it's important to make sure that your original file is safe. Now, those of you who own a Windows machine, I know you've never had the blue screen of death. Try having the blue screen of death or any other kind of interruption like that or file corruption after you've worked on your original file and you're screwed. So you always want to make a, a duplicate of your original and keep your original around for safekeeping in case you do have problems later on. By the way, in the useful downloads page, there is near the bottom, you can download a workflow chart, which is a linear representation of a proper workflow in Photoshop. We'll be using that a lot in class four, the master file creation and workflow. If you have my book, that linear flow chart is already in the front of the book and it's called workflow chart. I know, catchy, huh? Okay, we're gonna also create a master file and the goal is to create a multi-purpose unflattened master file for each image that you wish to enhance. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail on master files, so let's come back to that. Uh, one of the things that you can do with Photoshop is you can work globally as well as locally, and it gives you the ability to make corrections and adjustments locally, affects, which affects only a portion of your image by making selections covered in another workshop. In the old analog world, corrections are almost always global, uh, particularly when it came to color corrections, or you got into a lot of very fancy dodging and burning, uh, and you can get very creative with that, where you stick your hands or pieces of cardboard or coins welded on a piece of wire to hold back or lighten and darken certain areas of your image. You also want to work in adjustment layers, and you'll look if you'll look on the PowerPoint slide in front, you'll see a visual representation of what adjustment layers are. What layers are actually not just, these just happen to be adjustment layers I'm showing you. There's all sorts of different kinds of layers, but think of layers as transparent overlays, if you will, 
over your image, each layer doing something a little bit different. When you see the layers panel, think of it as a two-dimensional side view of your image. Here's your original capture down here, and here it is in this three-dimensional look. And then on this one here, we use the layer mask uh, and an adjustment layer to work on only a portion of the image. We adjusted contrast on that one. Then we worked on our color on this one, so on and so forth. And I hope that makes a little more sense. We'll talk about this a lot more in future classes, but when you see a black and white mask in your adjustment layer, that's exactly what it is. It is a layer mask where white reveals the effects of your adjustment layer and black hides. So for instance, on this layer right here where you see white, and you see it's, it's a sky is what it is. That's a palm tree. That sky is the only thing being adjusted. And it's not adjusting anything below. So that's one of the local corrections I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, I think it's easier to conceptualize adjustment layers when you see this picture here. We're still on the same page, page five, page five in the book also, if you have the book. Here's some more concepts. Uh, you should standardize your workflow. It's important that you work in the various steps of your image in the order shown in the workflow chart at the beginning of the book or uh, well, or that you can download. Uh, for instance, you always adjust your contrast before your color, because if you adjust your color and then adjust your contrast, you're probably gonna throw your color out. So that's why you want to standardize your workflow. And the best way to do that is to use the linear workflow chart that we will be working on in class four and that you can also download from the useful downloads page. And yes, anything on the useful downloads page is free. Tonal compression. Well, total compression is the inevitable reduction, degradation of the original scene from your eyes to the print. And it's pure physics. There's not a darn thing you can do about it. All you can do is minimize it. So I've made a little chart here to give you an idea. And this will also show you why you should be shooting for raw in your important images. This right here, this 100, this is what your eye sees. And let's just say it's 100 uh, uh, shades of color. If you shoot with your camera in raw, the tonal compression will automatically bring it down to 70 shades. And if you're shooting JPEG, you're down to 40. Now you see why you don't want to shoot your important stuff in JPEG. Then when you bring it into Photoshop, that 100 shades of color is now 30 shades. And in RAW, it's, it's 60 shades. And when you print it out, 45 shades and 15 shades for, uh, for JPEG. So you can see there's actually triple the amount of information available from a RAW file for your final print as far as tonal compression. So you'll see on page five, how can you minimize some of the effects of tonal compression? And that's all you can do. You can't eliminate it. Shoot in raw. And we've just shown on, on here why you should be shooting in raw. Use a proper color working space in Photoshop. We'll talk about that in class three and have your color management house in order. And we'll talk about color management in, actually talk about color working space and color management in class five. It's called Color Management 101. So I would encourage you to sign up for that also. There is a, uh, a post called The Philosophy of Raw. You can find a link to that in the notes, I believe. And that will explain some of the things about Raw that are really, really important. Next concept, if you start with a 16-bit file, then work in 16-bit as long as possible. If your original image is in 16-bit, which is such as a Raw file, keep working in 16-bit as long as you can in Photoshop at least through the creation of your master file. So you got gobs and oodles more information in 16-bit than you do in 8-bit. It's not just a doubling of the amount of information. It's hundreds of times more information because it's a logarithmic function. In the same way a Richter scale is, if you will, for an earthquake, where a 6.0 earthquake is twice as powerful as a 5.0 earthquake. Let's go to the next page, page 6. First thing is I would suggest that you work in Adobe RGB as your working color space or Profoto RGB, either one works. There is a blog, well, you'll have to go to the blog and search for it, but it's called Soft Proofing Plus RGB Color Spaces. And it will explain to you why I prefer Adobe RGB and other things that I think you'll find very, very useful. We're gonna talk about setting up your color settings in, in a minute here. Uh, and I'll show you physically in Photoshop how to do that so that your working space does become Adobe RGB. There is no color space in RAW. RAW is just literally a bucket of gobs and oodles of information. So if you, somebody says, well, I have Pro Photo in my RAW file. No, you don't. Okay. It's, there is no color space in RAW. 
you'll add a color space when you bring it through Adobe Camera Raw or Develop Module and then bring it into Photoshop. Save your file frequently as you're working. Uh, I, I like to save every time I add a new layer. That way I don't forget. And those that know me, well, in fact, you'll find a, <laughs> I told you you guys had homework in the, in the blog. There is a post called, not a fan of Photoshop speed keys. Here are the 10 essential ones. And here's one right here, the fourth bullet point down on page six, which is what we're on now, which is Command S, which is for save in a Mac, and Windows is Control S. Save it frequently. There's nothing worse than getting 45 minutes through an image like we talked about earlier and realize oh, you made a boo-boo and you just wasted 45 minutes. You know, save as you go along, and that way, if you do have a boo-boo, you can go back to the one point where you've always saved. Save your important images and your master files as a PSD or TIFF file, not JPEG. And there's three reasons which are listed on page six. Every time that you open, work on, and save a JPEG, there is degradation because a JPEG compression scheme is not what's called lossless. It's a very lossy compression scheme. A TIFF or a PSD, though, just so you know, is lossless when you save it. You're not going to throw any information out. You cannot save a JPEG in 16-bit, which takes away a lot of all the advantages of all that information. And you cannot save a JPEG with layers, which, again, will negate the effects of a master file, which, again, we're going to talk about in just a second. Next bullet point, save your master files at 300 pixels per inch. This is the optimum pixels per inch setting for viewing, prepping, and printing your image. Anything more than 300 pixels per inch is a waste because your eye cannot resolve it. Uh, anything less and you're not able to take advantage of your printer. And as an aside here, a little known fact, all printers out there are 300 pixels per inch digitally, 300 pixels per inch, not uh, dots per inch. There, are, Yes, there are inkjet printers out there that have 1,440 by 1,440 dots per inch of ink laid down. I know because I've counted them. Ha ha. Just kidding. So when you're saving your master file, it's no use. Or it's just a waste of, of space to save it at, at any more than 300 pixels per inch. And all printers, all means all, and that's all, all means all printers print at 300 pixels per inch from your file. Turn on the Photoshop's ruler for, uh, I'm on third bullet point from the bottom, page six. Turn on the Photoshop's ruler for easier viewing of your image. Uh, I like to have it turned on in the document window as it seems to give the image a sense of perspective. It talks about how to do that there uh, and to see what your image will look like. Next bullet point down, uh, what your image will look like size-wise in the real world on your monitor. There's a procedure there that you can go through at your, at your leisure where you're going to enlarge and reduce the size of your image. If you take a physical ruler and hold it up against your screen and then have your image up with the ruler viewing in your document window, you just basically get as close to one-to-one -to -one, and that is what your one-to-one -one value is. Why is that helpful? Because if you need to know your sharpening, you need to know what it actually, what your actual size is. So I hope that kind of makes sense. I kind of stumbled through that, but I think if you go back and read what I wrote here under this, uh, this bullet point on page six, second from the bottom, will make more, more sense. Flatten versus unflattened file. A flattened file has all the layers collapsed in the image as seen in the layers panel or reduce the file size. A flattened file is best for printing. And an unflattened file has all the, lower, the layers ex, uh, expanded in the layers panel. A master or archive file, which we're going to talk about next, should be unflattened so that you can easily make corrections later non-destructively, meaning low loss of data or pixels. If you recall, when we looked at, yeah, here's an image that's unflattened, if you will. And what we would do, and it would also reflect in the layers panel, when we flatten that image, and it talks about how to do that on page six, then you won't have all these various layers. They'll be down in one. And there's a reason for that, multiple reasons. Uh, uh, one is to reduce the file size before printing. You never want to flatten your master file, ever, ever, ever. Okay, let's go to the next thing, master file and workflow. We are now on page seven of the notes. Remember, I, I told you guys, I warned you, I'm giving you a lot of information and I don't want you to get bored and I don't want you to get discouraged. That's why there's homework. It worked in high school and college and it probably still works in life for those of us that still, still have homework, it seems like. But uh, I'm throwing a lot of information at you, so don't get discouraged. Master file and workflow, what you see here 
on the PowerPoint slide is a visual representation of a proper workflow for photographers in Photoshop. By the way, and I've already talked about the linear representation, uh, which you can download in the useful downloads, but I just want you to give you an idea of what this looks like visually. First thing we're gonna do that uh, we would open our file in RAW, including RAW. We would adjust contrast, brightness, use saturation, enhancements, layers, and we would create our master file. What you're gonna notice is about the left side here of this chart, this, this visual representation, is this is where you're gonna pour your creative mojo if you will, into it, with the exception of cropping, because there's a lot of creativity that can go into cropping also, but you don't want to crop your master file either. So the right-hand side is what you're going to do with that master file after the fact. I do not, by any stretch of the imagination, I do not bring every image into, into Photoshop, only those ones that I want, gonna, I know I'm going to do something with. And after carefully editing and culling and going through and picking and, and what have you. My ratio typically is about one or two out of a hundred images that I shoot that I really want to work with. Be a tough self-editor. And by the way, we're going to talk about that the last half an hour of class five edit for success. So if you haven't signed up for that, you want to do that. What is a master file? Let's go to the next slide here. We're still on page seven. Page seven, if you're in the book also. What is a master file? It's a 16-bit, unflattened, unsharpened, uncropped, unresized file designated as such in its file name. So why create a master file? Well, it's multi-purpose. As you can see from the chart here, once we've created the master file, we can do whatever we need to it. So for instance, if you enter the San Diego County Fair in 2021, which we, I'm sure you will, uh, you create your master file before you actually even enter. Then you take that master file and you would go back in the chart and you would flatten, resize, crop, sharpen to size, and then you would save it for the web. Because in tier one, you only send in the JPEG. In tier two, if you make it to tier two, because one out of three images do, then you would go back to your master file. But this time, instead of saving it to size for the web, which is totally different, you would save it for print. So I hope that kind of makes sense. That's why what I mean by multi-purpose. It's easily correctable because we are using adjustment layers. I also should mention that you are only going to sharpen to size. It's applied according to your print size. If That's why you'll see sharpening over here. Because if you sharpen your master file, let's say you have a typical master file of uh, 12 by 18 inches at 300 ppi. If you sharpen that master file and you decide you want an 8 by 10, your 8 by 10 is, is over sharpened. So you always sharpen two size. You never sharpen your master file. Let's go to page, yes, page eight, also page eight in the book. You wanna save your master files as TIFFs or PSDs, not as JPEGs. And I mentioned quite a, a few reasons for those, but you can also see those same reasons on page eight. I prefer .psd files, but that's only so that I can differentiate them from other files in my folder, which I'm gonna show you folder structure towards the end of this program so you can see what I'm talking about. If you save as a TIFF or a PSD, every time you, well, I already mentioned it, you can't save a JPEG as 16-bit. We want to save ours as 16-bit. And you can't save with layers in a JPEG. So, you know, that rules that out too. TIFF or PSD, um, my personal preference is to, it, it is mentioned on page eight, is to save as a .psd to further differentiate my master file and all the other files. Plus a PSD file saves a bit faster and has built-in lossless file compression resulting in smaller master files compared to a TIFF. So I will let you go through the rest of that page eight uh, for part of your homework to uh, know more about TIFF versus PSD. Here at the bottom, oh, actually you'll find a link on page eight of the notes. Oh yeah, you do. Here's a link uh, of my video recorded live that perfectly encapsulates how best to use Photoshop for the photographer with a diverse range of images. Uh, a lot of people that are here tonight were at that class and, and back in April and will find it useful also. It, you can think of it as a study video, if you will. I mean, it's an hour and 20 minutes long. How do you eat an elephant, bite-sized pieces? Same thing here. Watch 20 minutes at a time if you have to. And the other nice thing about this one right here, unlike the other videos, is it has not only a table of contents, so you can, if you only want to watch 20 minutes at a time, but it also is heavily annotated, which the other ones are not, you know, notes uh, that arrows that'll point to things and, and all that kind of stuff. All I have 
for the live situation is this little red circle. So I would encourage you to spend some time with that video. So let me open Photoshop. And we are now on page nine. And I want to show you general preferences and how to set those up. So I am using, as I mentioned, Photoshop Creative Cloud. I'm using the latest version. I automatically just update whenever something new comes out. First thing we want to do is we want to go to our general preferences. Oh, and I am on a Mac, just so you know. So if it doesn't look familiar across the top here, that's that's probably why. So to open your general preferences, you can see the methods, uh, where to find uh, on the notes, where to find minute. Now, I'm going to go to what it says for a Mac, Photoshop preferences. And for now, I'm just going to click general at the top. You can see when I go to this menu, there's a whole bunch of different options. Just go to general because all of these ones are listed to the left side in the general preferences screen like we see here. You should leave all of the settings in your general preferences at the default settings until you gain more experience with Photoshop, except for the four shown below. These may not make sense right now, but they will as we further explore Photoshop. First thing we want to do is click the Tools tab on the left-hand side. And I'm just taking the, these in order. And I'll click on the Tools, and you can see a different set of preferences comes up. The first thing you want to do is make sure that Zoom resizes windows. Let me unclick this, and I'll come back and show you why. Now, if I enlarge, and by the way, these are three. These are not of the notes necessarily, but it's one of the. These are three of those ten essential speed keys: Command Plus, Command Minus, and Command Zero, or Control Plus, Minus, and Zero if you're in a PC. So if I go com Command Plus, you see how the it enlarges, but the frame itself doesn't change the size. And the same if I zoom in, the document window stays anchored and the image will reduce and enlarge regardless. If I instead, let me go back to preferences, and I'm just gonna go straight to tools right here. If instead I hit zoom resizes windows, now when I enlarge and, and zoom in and out, the image stays the exact same size as the document window. So that's the first thing I would also do. The second is while you're still in the Tools tab, let me go back to that, and I'll go to Tools right here. While you're in the Tools tab, check Show Tool Tips, and it's right here. And all that is, in fact, I can show it by using this. If I hold my mouse over something, like I just, whatever this vector tools, whatever it tells me what it is, or over here, Zoom Resizes Window, determines whether document windows resize when zooming so on and so forth. So you want to make sure the show tool tips is on because it really, really makes a big difference. I still use them. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Now you're going to go to the history log tab. Here it is right here. And check on history log, which it's already checked. Then choose metadata and detailed. Why do I do that? Because if I have an image, let me give you an idea here. I'm going to close this temporarily, and I'm going to just uh, create a levels adjustment layer. It doesn't make any difference what it is. I just want to show you. Now I can go to the File menu, File Info, and then choose Photoshop. It, it's got all sorts of nonsense, but choose Photoshop. And there is a a it's a history log you may not be able to understand a lot of it but if you send me an image that you want to know what's going on if you have this set then i can look through your history log and figure out what it is you've done that's different than the history panel and the history panel over here on the right after you're done with it and we're going to talk about this in a bit after you're done with it and you close that image it erases all this history so the history log will still tell us what it is that has happened to your image. So I'd encourage you to do that. And last, on under general preferences, I'm going to go back to preferences, and I'm going to choose workspace and uncheck open documents and tab. I can't. I think this is the, the silliest function, but this is just me. If you don't uncheck that every time you open it, it ends up like this, where it's tabbed across the top. And I don't want that because now I can't see all of my image. So I don't like it when it automatically opens as a tab. So that's why I did that, where I workspace and uncheck open documents as tabs. One other thing while we're in here, if you go to the interface tab, and this is 
at the bottom of page nine, Photoshop interface color themes. When you go to this, you're given a choice of up here. There's a lot of stuff in here, but these are the ones that you really need to worry about. You see how everything is dark? I'm sorry, I can't stand that. I find it depressing. And I think that's the way it comes. Uh, and I know Lightroom is the only way it comes. The develop module to me is too dark and too cluttered compared to Adobe Camera Raw plugin. And they are the same functions, whether you're using it, uh, the Adobe Camera Raw plugin, which we'll talk about in class three, or uh, develop module to accomplish. I recommend you do uh, use ACR, but uh, read through those three blog posts on Lightroom versus Photoshop and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So this is the color theme that I prefer. This one's too light and this one's just about right. It, it approaches a 50% gray, at least on the background, and that's just kind of the way I like it. I'll go ahead and hit OK. Let's go ahead and scroll down to page 10. I'm going to hide Photoshop for a second. Screen background and menu colors. Give yourself an edge and choose the best conditions for judging color balance on your computer monitors. I love my grandkids. Uh, and they're cuter than your grandkids, just so you know. But I'm not going to put them on my background screensaver, desktop, whatever you call it, because it's distracting. Again, in class five, we talk about ways to get your color management house in order. And one of them, is, step three, talks exactly about these colors here. Those that were here for class five know I showed you a lot of optical illusions on why you need to use the tools that are provided. And one of those tools is to have a gray background. The other thing too, and this is not necessarily in here, but those that know me know that I probably have the largest collection of gray and black t-shirts known to humankind for that very reason. I would, I love Hawaiian shirts, but I would never wear one when I'm judging critically prints or something on my screen. So that's all part of class five. And there is a recording for class five, by the way, if you want to jump ahead on that. Let's go to color settings menu, which is on page 10. Purpose. The settings will allow you to correctly color manage for consistency and repeatability. So where do you find? And it talks about where to find them. Oh, it's the same. Uh, it's the edit menu, color settings on a Mac or a PC. So I'll go to edit menu, color settings down near the bottom. When you first get this, just so you know, it looks like this. All these numbers, believe it or not, mean something, but you can probably ignore them all if you follow the step I'm going to tell you. Instead of going North America General Purpose 2, which is just a preset that Adobe has put together, I'm going to suggest that you go down here and go to North America Prepress 2. And it shows that in page 10. And why do we do that? Mainly because if you look in North America General Purpose, our working space is sRGB. We'll talk about working spaces later. There's some stuff on my blog that talk about working spaces, but sRGB is a very small, consumer-based color space. Again, if you want to think in terms of buckets of colors, it has a small bucket of colors available to it. So we want to change this to Adobe RGB. So if you do this and select North America, pre-press two, you can see that it chooses the Adobe RGB 1998 color working space, which is what I suggest. And again, if you want to know more about that, I explain that in detail in that blog post that I mentioned earlier about Color space, soft proofing and color spaces, I think it was called. By the way, you can ignore CMYK grand spot. You're never going to know that. Remember I said you only need 10 or 15% of the program? Here's a really good example. If you're ever using CMYK, you're in the wrong color space. Get out of that completely. CMYK grand spot are mostly for offset printing. Color management policies, it will preserve any of the profiles that it has. If there's a profile mismatch, it will ask when opening and so on and so forth. So once I've done that and I hit OK, now my color space, my working color space is Adobe RGB. Let me grab an image, here it is. I wanna open this image and show you what happens. This image is not in the proper color working space. And so you'll see an embedded profile mismatch warning explained at the bottom of page 10. And this image has an embedded color profile of sRGB, the consumer space. I do not want to do the use the embedded profile. I want to convert to the document colors working space. Even though I shot in sRGB and I choose Adobe RGB and all that gobbledygook that I showed you in the color settings, there is a setting that will actually add pixels to the image fairly intelligently. 
So you do want to convert document colors to the working space. And it says that at the bottom of page 10, page 11, if you're in the book. So once we do that, we'll hit OK, and then the image will open. And I really need to do something with a newer image, mainly because this young man is now, well, he'll be 12 in August, and that's my daughter, my middle daughter. But that's OK. Like I told you, they're cute, right? OK, now let's go to page 11. The next two or three sections, I am going to consider this homework. Set up your workspace with panels. Think of panels as miniature workspaces. I'm on page 11, page 13 in the book, each accomplishing a different function. There are almost two dozen different panels available to you, but in the spirit of keeping it super simple, I would suggest that you start with just nine and add those you deem necessary as you gain more experience. You can see the nine on here. This is what I want you to do, is I want you to go to the link on page 11, and uh, if this was printed out, then it has the QR code on the right. You can use that if you want. Either one will get you to the blog page with a video. It's about a five-minute video that will talk about how to adjust all of your panels. There's a reason that I have them all in a particular way and in a particular order. As you can see, I can change a lot of things, and I can save this workspace too. That's really what page 11 and 12, page 13 and 14 in the book are talking about. And rather than go through that, I'm going to make that homework. If that's all right, it's a five-minute video. You can follow along with the notes that you've got here. And I think you can set your workspace up to get the most out of Photoshop. The other thing, too, and if you go back up to page 11, I should have mentioned this earlier, you can also install a custom Photoshop workspace preferences file, a .psw file to help you get started. And if you go to, well, it, it's under the useful downloads. I know that link says free color real stuff, but it, that really is the useful downloads page. You can download this file with the instructions. You can install this file, and then it will actually add all of these panels and no more. They may be mixed up. They may you know, look like something like this or whatever, and you're going to have to adjust them. But once you go through and read through how to do this, you're not going to have any problem with it. So that's kind of homework there. We're going to go to page 13, let's see, 13 and 14, page 15 and 16 in the book. And again, I'm going to do the same thing here. There is a five-minute video, as you can see in the notes at the top of page 15, uh, page 15 of the book, page 13 in the notes on the tools panel and the color picker. Tools panel is generally over here on the left-hand side, and the color picker is basically found anywhere you have a choice of color. So if I'm using the text tool, for instance, you'll see up here, there's a little box, okay? When I click on this, then the color picker will come up. This one happens to be for text color. Let me close that because I want to get back to the, the tools panel real quick. There are actually over 50 some odd tools available to you, and this is all in the video, but I just want to show you a few quick things. If you notice in some of these tools, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little triangle. When you see the triangle, it means that there are tools underneath it. There's more than one tool in that box. So I'll click on that and I can bring up the quick selection tool instead. Or what was I talking about? The magnet. Oh, look at there. That wonderful magnetic lasso tool that I've never used. You're only going to need, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe off of the top of my head, 15 or 20 tools total, if that. And so don't get overwhelmed with that. You'll see a diagram also on page 13 of the more common ones. So I wanted to bring that up. The color picker. So I'm going to use the foreground and the background color, and I'll click on the foreground color, and you see my color is white. So it's easiest to use for a photographer's purpose when the H radio button, which stands for you, is picked. You'll notice that there's all sorts of different buttons in here depending on the color model that you want. I suggest that you go to the H for you and use that one. And it's the easiest to use. I don't use any other. That's the one I've used for years. So there's three ways you can change the color. Uh, one is to click in the color palette here on the right, on the left. Well, yeah, on the left, the other right, and drag that circle wherever you want that color. The second way is to click on the RGB values down here. Let's say I want middle gray, which is 127. I'm not changing the radio button, by the way. I'm just changing the values right down here, 127. 127. What I had for my foreground color was white, and now when I click this, it would be, of course, a neutral gray. Let's say that you want to change the U. You can also take these sliders and you can move it back and forth. If you want to choose a green color, then do so. 
or a blue. Or if you want to get a sky blue color, you can kind of play with it. Like if I look at that, that's not sky blue. It's a little pink. So I'll bring it down a little bit more like that. You see where we're going with this? Oops, maybe it's a little dark. So I'll lighten it, move it over here. And there's my, my color that I'm looking for. Again, I stay on the H button and I, the three ways, one is to drag it around. The other is to pick, uh, to click the numbers in there and see, move the sliders in the vertical rainbow colored bar to change your U. Okay, and then once you change that color, you hit okay, then it would be my foreground color, as you can see. We're now on page 15. And again, there's a video on this one too. I think this is the last of the videos. The rest of them, you'll have to use the notes and I'll, I'll spend a little more time with them. The navigator panel is right up here. Let me open an image again here. Actually, a better way is to, I'll just open uh, this one again. Oh, there's our embedded profile mismatch because I didn't save it. I'll hit OK. That converts it to the working space. And the navigator panel allows you to navigate around your image at large magnifications. Here's the navigator panel over here. I've also listed, gosh, more than half of those 10 essential speed keys are listed at the bottom of page 15, just so you know. So if I want to enlarge on this, and remember, the document window enlarges with the image. All I can see is what the red box is showing me. But if I want to, you know, zoom in on, on Aiden's head, then I can do that by dragging the red box and so on and so forth. You can also hold down the space bar key, which I'm doing right now, and I can drag it around with my left mouse button pressed. Command plus, command minus, command zero, or control, if you will, for those others to enlarge and, and reduce. And between those functions, you can navigate around an image real quick, even if you have limited screen real estate, if you will. Here's another one I should show also is the tab key. And if I hit the tab key, it makes all of the panels disappear temporarily. If I hit tab key again, it brings them all back. I've I've had people that have called me up going, oh my gosh, oh my God, I can't, I can't find my panels. What do I do? So, you know, just hit the tab key again and they'll come back. Let's go to page 16. Okay, history panel. Let me take this image and I'm I'm gonna just kind of show you. Every time I perform an action in Photoshop, and we're gonna talk about this in class two, by the way. In class two, we're actually gonna work on images. In fact, we're gonna work on y'all's images, just so you know. And let's say I make an adjustment. You can see up here in the history, it says, okay, I modified that levels layer. Let's say I add a U saturation and I, let's be ridiculous here. There, I'll make it ridiculous. And I change that. Well, I go, oh, well, uh, that isn't good. So I can do one of two things. I can bring this back to zero or I can go back in history. Okay, does that make sense? Every time you perform a function that changes your file, a history state is created. You click on the name of your desired location above the last entry to, entry to go back in history. By default, Photoshop will save 50 history states. That's more than enough. If you wanna change it to more, go for it, but you, you probably don't need to. I never do. 50 history states is a lot. It used to be only 20, so that's a newbie in Photoshop Creative Cloud. Keep in mind three things. If you go back and forth between various history states and don't work on and change your image, all the history states that followed are saved. So if I go back here, if you go back to a previous history state like here, then change your image, which I'll do. And let's say that I'm just gonna change that. Everything below is lost. So when your image is closed in Photoshop, all of the current history states are lost. I would encourage you, I believe there's also, oh, there is, excellent. There's a nice five minute video on that. So there's 15 minutes worth of videos that will get you through those last five or six things that we just talked about. Let's go to page 17, page 19 and 20 in the book. And let's look at the document window. There's a lot of information that can be gleaned from the document window without opening separate menus to find that information elsewhere. Everything that's, that's highlighted in red on page 17, you're also gonna find in here. So here's the name of the image. Here's the magnification. And by the way, on this particular monitor, 66.7 equals one inch. And you can see that I have my ruler active. By the way, here's how you turn your ruler off, view, ruler. Okay, you see how it gives a no perspective. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the ruler that I talked about in under concepts or controls or one of those, I don't remember now. Okay, we have the name, the magnification, the layer that it's currently on, the active layer. So if I go back here and change it to background, then it will say background. It will tell you the color space, which is RGB and the bit depth. So if this was a 16 bit, then obviously that would say 16 there. 
then you're going to see this little asterisk. If you see this asterisk here on the right side, it means that you have not saved this image. So if I save this image, let me just save it to the desktop so I don't confuse myself. Then not only will the asterisk disappear, but in your history panel, you'll also see the word saved. It's kind of hard to see here. Let me drag it out a little bit. See, whoops. So you can kind of see it. You see how it says it says saved there? So we did actually save that. If your document has not been saved, you see the asterisk outside the parentheses, and you won't see this one very often. In fact, let me close this one and open that first one again, the one that was not in the proper color space. And let's say I decide that I don't convert to the document colors workspace and I use the embedded profile and I hit OK. You see how there's an asterisk inside the parentheses? That means you're in the wrong working space. Let's say I do something and then I'll enlarge it so you can see. OK. So just keep that in mind that if you see that asterisk in there, then you're in the wrong working space. I think that pretty much covers the document window. Oh, there are a couple other things here I should mention. Down here at the bottom left-hand side is the magnification that's also shown up here. And it will show the document size. If you add a whole bunch of, uh, let me add a whole bunch of layers or something here so you can kind of see. You'll notice that, oh, well, it should. I guess because I haven't done anything with these yet. Normally you have file size measurements here, if you will. The one on the left is the actual file size without layers. And just because I haven't done any work on this, that file size is still 17.2. But I'll show you in some other images in a minute that if you have a bunch of layers and they've been worked on, your, your file size is considerably bigger. So that's what you're seeing down there. You can also click here and there's a whole bunch of different things. If you wanna know, uh, uh, I mean, I don't use these very often, but if you wanna see like right now, I, I can click on that and I can see that not only here, is it in the wrong working space because of the asterisk inside the parentheses, like it says on page 17, 19, and 20 in the book, but I also can see it down here. I rarely change this and prefer to keep it on document size, but if you want to know documents dimensions, for instance, you can click there and it'll tell you it's whatever that is. So there is a lot of information that you can glean uh, without actually having to go into different menus to find stuff. Okay, let's go to page 18. We're on page 21 in the book, page 18 in the notes. Changing numerical values. Let me click on a level adjustment layer here on the bottom. Remember, this is a two-dimensional view of this image that's got three layers on top of it, okay? And there's the background copy. We're looking at the edge of the image with those analog example of clear plastic overlays on top of it. And so that's what we're looking at there. Back to changing numerical values. There are three main ways to change the numerical values in Photoshop, various tools, adjustments, and functions. The first is the one we're all familiar with. You take your left mouse button, hold it down, and I could drag from left to right. And what I'm doing, and I'm not, I'm not making any sense of what I'm doing now. I just want to show you the functions. So don't pay attention to what you see in the way of color and contrast in the image. That's not the point. So that's the first way. The second way is with your cursor placed in the numerical value box below it, and I just clicked in there, you can see it's highlighted, you can see the flashing cursor. I use my up and down arrow keys, which is really nice for fine tuning. So you can think of the slider that I did the first time by holding down the left mouse button and dragging it as a course adjustment, and then clicking in the box below that slider and adjusting with my numerical up and down keys. You can also insert an actual value in here, but I can tell you that it's been years, maybe even decades since I've actually done that. You can see the example on the picture of page 18, pretty much what I just did there. And if you're doing this and you're using the arrow keys or what have you, you can tab between the various keys. Right now I'm in the black point slider. And if I want to make an adjustment with the arrow keys and the next one over, I can hit the tab key and the tab key again. I can also hit shift tab and go back and, and forth in those. Okay, let's go to the cursor, page 19. Don't like the mouse cursor shape as it shows in your image. Now, of course, I have a red, let me move that for a second. If you don't like the cursor as it shows in your image, you can't seem to find the cursor, or you just keep clicking on the image and something happens that you don't expect it, well, simply change the tool on the tools panel uh, to something less likely to give you a weird result if you click accidentally your image. So for instance, the move tool, I like because it's easily visible. You can see it all over the place. And if I click it, nothing's really gonna happen right now. 
I also like the hand tool, which is right down here in the tools panel. And again, the same thing. It's very, very easy to see. But let's say I have the magic wand tool and I accidentally click there and I go, oh my goodness, what just happened? Well, all you did was you made a selection when you didn't want to. So you can go back in your history panel and click on the one above it and then choose another cursor, in this case, a magic tool and carry on doing your business. Okay. Do you use a graphics tablet or mouse when editing photos? Ashif, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I am old school, and so I use a mouse. And again, those that know me, I, I am the most left-handed guy in the world, except for two things, using a right-handed mouse and drums. And that's it. I have tried graphics tablets, and they just confuse me. Now, that being said, that is a personal preference. I would strongly recommend checking out Stephen Burns is another a teacher of Photoshop here in San Diego. Now his gig is the Photoshop artistry that I talked about earlier, putting chicken heads on people and creating mind-blowing surrealistic scenes that defy logic and imagination. That's his gig. And so I know that he used those tablets a lot. But again, I'm old school. I only want to use 10 to 15% of this program. And so I use a mouse. That's just me. He used to be a, a coordinator for the San Diego County Fair, and I believe he was the one that got me involved in judging at the fair back in the early 2000s. Okay, let's see. Let's go to op duplicating and renaming files. There are three main ways to open a file in Photoshop. The first is the most obvious. Go to File Menu, Open, and then choose your file by going through wherever to find it. You can also double-click on the Workspace Background and it will also, it's the same as file open. And then the third way on a Mac, create a Photoshop icon on your dock, then drag your desired file to it. On a PC, same thing. Create a Photoshop shortcut on your desktop, then drag your desired file to it. Let's use this as an example. I'm just gonna close this and not save it. And let me hide Photoshop. And here's this image over here on the right-hand side. In fact, I can put the, uh, the red circle back on. And I'm going to drag this to the Photoshop icon in my dock. Or if you have your Photoshop icon on your desktop in a PC. And let's say you got a, in a document window. This is Mac or PC. And I want to open this file. Well, rather than go back to open and, and finding this wherever it is in this document window, I could just drag it to that icon or to the, to the icon in the dock. And it's the same as file open. That's one of the biggest time savers in the world. That's one that I would suggest you get in the habit of using a lot. Two ways to duplicate a file. Let me open, oh, actually, here, we'll just use this one. Okay, two ways to duplicate a file. And when you get to the workflow chart, the linear workflow chart that I talk about, the very first thing you're gonna do is duplicate your file. I just want to show you how you can duplicate it in Photoshop. Usually I duplicate it before I bring it into Photoshop. We just go to the image menu and duplicate. And it'll automatically put the word copy right after it. And when I do, then I can open that and what have you. I'm not going to keep that open. Don't need to. The other way is in the document window on a Mac, you right mouse click on your file and go to duplicate. And it will do the same thing. It will put that file. You can see how I put that file right in there for us. Okay. On a PC, it shows you how to do that. And the best way to rename a file is not in Photoshop, but in your computer's operating system. For instance, on this image here, the image that the client gave me is this one right here, Queen Mary 24 by 36. Well, it's not unusual for me to deal with hundreds, sometimes even thousands of images a week. So I put the client's initials, the name of the file, and the size sometimes, it really just kind of depends. But if I'm gonna rename something, I'm gonna rename it right here. And all I have to do is right mouse click, and choose rename, and then I can change whatever I need to in there. I'm not going to, but just so I, I know that. Do you lose pixels when you duplicate? Absolutely not. No, none whatsoever. That's why you want to duplicate and work on something other than your original. Okay, save. Oh, we're almost done. I'm going to breeze through this real quick. When you're saving a file, let me just do something to it. Photoshop gives you two main options, save and save as, and you can find both of these under the file menu right up here, save and save as, command S. Remember, that's that speed key. Well, this is gonna be a different file, so I wanna save as. 
what I want to do is I want to go to the operating systems save as dialog box. And this is on a Mac. And then I'm going to choose my location. And if I save it as a TIFF, well, I'll have to show you something else to do that. But once I save it, wherever I'm going to save it, let me save this one to the desktop just to be different. I'll save it as a PSD. This, of course, is where you're going to save TIFF, PSD, JPEG, all of that in this drop down menu. And then I save it. I want to save this JPEG as a TIFF. The first time I save it as a TIFF, and I'll go down to File, Save As, and I'm going to save this as a TIFF. The first time I do that, I want to get this dialog box here, which says TIFF Options. In the spirit of KISS, don't do anything. Just hit OK. okay? And it says that halfway through page 21. Few things to consider when saving your files. I'm going to let you all read through page 21. At the bottom there, a few things to consider. Uh, we've already talked about saving your master file as an unflattened TIFF or PSD. So a lot of this is a repeat on the bottom of page 21. Last page, file naming conventions. All right, I'm done with Photoshop for the time being. It's important to establish and use an easy to understand naming convention. Of course, everyone will develop their own system, but let me make some suggestions. I typically include an underscore capital N at the end of a file name for an unflattened master or archive file. For a flattened file ready for printing, I will instead include a print size, such as 11 by 14 at the end of a file name. That's why when you looked at this one, this one's ready to print to size. That's why it had the measurements in there. It won't be unusual to have multiple files from the same image. So the original raw file, duplicated, renamed raw file, XMP sidecar file, the master file, and so on. So let me go to this right here. The first thing I do is I decide on a name for the image. And this particular image is called Bodhi 10811. So I make a folder, just like it says here, bullet points one through whatever at the bottom of page 22, page 26 in the book. So if I open this, you can see that I have all the images. I don't have the original file in here. I should, and then I would change it to the name I decided, which matches the name of the folder. You can see that there's a master file already in here. There's some to 8 by 10, 7 by 10, and, and so on and so forth. You can also see why I like making it a .psd format, because it would differentiate it from all the other files if I had the underscore M and the .psd. So if I open this in here, and again, I can just drag it from the window right to the icon, then you can see this is indeed a master file with all of its various and sundry layers that I have for it. Okay, pretty much takes care of it. Again, I've given you a lot of information. I'm sure I've skipped over a lot of it. I'm sure I've stumbled in saying some things. I'm sure that I've left some stuff out. If you have questions after you've done your homework, please email me. Thank you very much for hanging out, and God bless you all.